Please turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look at just a couple of verses there tonight, Hebrews 12. Looking at verses 1 and 2, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'd like to speak tonight on the title, The Race. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you bless this evening um, and all that's uh, been done up to this point. We thank you, Lord, that uh, our desire is to, here is to worship you and to praise you biblically. God, we ask that you would bless your word tonight as it goes out, or that we would uh, realize that it's uh, your word that's uh, given for us and uh, preserved for us. It's something that's usable. It's quick and powerful. Lord, I pray we'd find your word to be that way in our lives. Not in the lives of others, but in our own life. But your word is, is effective for us. I ask again that you bless this evening. In your name we pray. Amen. The word uh, wherefore there, the first word of the chapter, means forget about the chapter divisions. We've got to go back before that and see what, what happened bef- before that time. Uh, when the editors, the men that were uh, translating the Bible into English uh, in the 1500s, 1500s particularly, one of them was uh, translated from a Greek text, and this, uh, th- this man had to make the Bible something that could be studied easier, went in and, and put in the chapter and the verse divisions. Um, the uh, originals didn't have that. It's simply a way for us to get around the Bible easier. Uh, it would take all of us a long time if the man preaching said, turn to the book of Hebrews, and I'm going to read the starting with the word wherefore, and you had... What we have now is 13 chapters to search through and try to find where that word is at. So that helped people be able to study the Bible. We now have chapters and verses. Uh, We have to watch out that we don't think that those chapters start a brand new thought. This one doesn't. Uh, The wherefore in verse 1 of chapter 12 goes all back through chapter 11, which contains the short biographical sketches of many men of God that live lives of faith. So because our word wherefore begins verse 12, we have to uh, consider uh, the previous context uh, when we're looking at this verse. And uh, the verse goes on to say, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. There's a lot of witnesses to what's going on. Paul said here, he says, and these witnesses see us. At his time, he said, we are compassed about. Uh, and the inference in to that is that it's the same for us today. There's been several times when God opened up heaven and let man take a look and see the fact that um, heaven knew what was going on on earth. One time was in the days of Elisha, when Elisha's servant doubted the fact that they had the ability to defeat this army. And God pulled back heaven and said, look up there. And uh, see that mighty host that is on uh, our side, that is at our disposal. Another time was when the shepherds got the uh, word that Jesus Christ was being born. And uh, the angels lit the sky up to those shepherds on the hill that night, singing the uh, praises of the newly born Messiah, the, the God with us, Emmanuel. God came to dwell with man at that time, and the angels of heaven came out to validate that fact. And here we have another time when we have a glimpse into the cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. Paul uses here, we believe Paul, many do, uh, wrote the book of Hebrews. Some, some say other men, but we'll say Paul did. He uses here a picture of a race. And uh, in this race, he says, these, there are these witnesses watching. All eyes are on the arena, the the Colosseum, the field of play, and uh, the action is draws attention. When there's um, a a, a hard fought match, people pay that much more attention. If you go to a sporting event and it's a it's a blowout, 
You know, people are running off to the snack shop to find out what the, the next thing they can buy is. But if it's tight, if it's close, no, nobody's getting up out of their seats. There's nobody leaving during the fourth quarter. They're watching to the very end. You've probably been in or seen uh, events like that. I was in a couple when I was younger, much younger, and the one that uh, I just never will forget and never will be allowed to forget is uh, when, when I was in the 10th grade, our, our basketball team wasn't very, hadn't been very good, and, and that year we started to get a little bit better. And we came to the end of the year and had a tournament, just a 14 tournament. Won the first night. That means we went back to the championship game for the second night. First time ever being in a, in a final game, even among four schools. And uh, it, was a, it was a tight game. And uh, we found ourselves up at the end with, with 10 seconds left, up by four points. The other team threw the basketball in to their good player. And uh, he worked his way down and it hit a shot with about seven seconds left. By the time that our guy got the rebound underneath the basket, all he would have had to do was just hold the ball because you have five seconds to throw the basketball in and time would have run out. We would have won by two points. But he looked down the basketball court and saw that one of our guys was running all the way down at the end, was standing underneath our basket wide open because all their team was trying to stop everything real close. One of our guys was down there waving his hands at the other end of the court, ready to receive the pass and get the open layup. And so our guy grabbed the ball, and as hard as he could, he threw it, but he was standing right underneath the backboard, and the ball bounced off the back of the backboard, back against the wall, and that is out of bounds. That's the other team's ball if you do something like that. Don't ever do something like that. That's extremely dumb. And the guy that did that has heard that from us many times as well. So the other team calls timeout, and they go set up their play. We know they're going to their senior who scored the last shot. He's probably had 30, 35 points that night. We know that they're going to go for two points to try to put the game into overtime. No one had even shot a three-pointer that night. So our defense was to put everybody pretty close to the basket and stop those close passes to their best player, which we did. The referee handed the man the ball. He has five seconds to throw it in. He's looking, looking, looking this way, and he turns off to his left. And out in the corner of the basketball court, where the baseline meets the sideline, stood a fellow 10th grader on their team who uh, wasn't a starter, who was one of these guys, sorry if you do this, but he's one of the guys that had to wear the big, thick goggles to protect his eyes and the big, thick band that went around and kind of stuck his hair up in the back a little bit. Okay, Left-handed, I remember this way too well, standing out in the corner by himself. At the last second before they called five seconds, they throw the ball out to him. And we watch as he grabs that ball with his left hand he doesn't even shoot it right. He shoots it from down by his hip, and he flings the ball. At that point, all eyes were on the action. The witnesses were quiet. They were watching to see what was going to happen. And all of our team, again, were standing so close to the basket because that's who we were guarding. We had a bird's eye view of watching that ball float through the air with this perfect rotation and hit nothing but net, and if we were captivated by the sound of the net swishing, we soon were shook out of that by the sound of the buzzer going off, signifying the end of the game. Five guys dressed in blue and white collapsed on the ground. Five guys dressed in red and white started to sprint around the court, shouting and screaming the most... Uh, Maddening cheer I've ever heard in my life. All eyes were on the arena that day, and that's something that um, I remember well. It didn't matter, really, that for the next two years, we never lost to that team again. In fact, we played them when I was a senior in high school in, in, in the last game that I ever played in high school. By halftime, we were up 40 to 10. 
That still didn't matter. All that guy had to do was say, hey, remember that shot at the buzzer? Do you remember when I hit that shot? So you know what? Will you get over that? Will you please stop talking about that shot? To add insult to injury, last year, uh, Pastor Dameron and I were out. We were preaching in some high school chapels in, in Ohio, in West Virginia, and, and uh, through the area there. I preached in this school where this team was at and, and had a good time in chapel and <clears throat> preached and getting ready to go. And I was packing my stuff up. And around the corner, as I was getting ready to go, comes this guy's mom, Mrs. Jacobs. And she looked at me and smiled from ear to ear. She said, Danny, do you remember that shot Joe hit? I said, Mrs. Jacobs, I think about it all the time. She goes, oh, it was great, wasn't it? I said, it depends on whose team you were on, I guess. But when the action is interesting, when there's something going on, everybody watches and there's no temptation to go away and leave because something's happening and all eyes are fixed on the competition. When we think about this verse, we think to a passage in 1 Corinthians that we'll reference in a minute that shows us also that Paul uses this idea of athletics compared to the Christian life several times. He uses the idea of a race here. He uses the idea of wrestling. He uses the idea of boxing. But he tells us that there's this cloud of witnesses. I mean, maybe he's telling us that if we look back and read in Hebrews 11, when we get going in our Christian life and hit that hard spot or find that time we're ready to quit, maybe we ought to think about some of the men that are listed in Hebrews 11. And ask ourselves if they ever wanted to quit too. They're just made out of the same clay that we are. God didn't put them there for us to make them some supernatural heroes. In fact, when we look at those men, every single one of them, we could find deep problems with their life. But they were men of faith, meaning they were men of endurance. They were men that continued on despite the difficulty and the hardness and the conflict that they had to go through in order to succeed. Track and field is talked about in Hebrews. It's also talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, where the Bible says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. The Holy Spirit inspired both books and both tell us that this life is indeed a race. And 1 Corinthians tells us, run the race to win the race. Don't run the race to just show up. Run the race for the purpose of winning. Some observations here about the text in, in Hebrews. The race that we're running is particular for each one of us. The Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Set before us means marked out for us. It is what is marked out. It's the word stadium. It's a certain race that is set for you. There's a certain race that is set for me. That race is particular for us and we're to do it with patience. Perseverance, continuance, it's not a sprint, it's a long distance race. And we run, according to 1 Corinthians 9, in a way to win. How do we do that? What is winning? I, I did, I've never done it. Pastor Vogel knows probably a lot about it. He's done it and, and, it, and, his, and his school has done it a few times. But the idea of cross country There's one guy that may come across the line first, but a team is also going to win. It's set up to where uh, of a team of seven, two guys aren't going to get their name on anything, but they can help their team win. There's an individual winning and there's a team winning. What is our winning? It's pleasing God. Pleasing God is our goal. 
Pleasing God is why we run the race that each one of us has individually laid out before us. In our race, there's something that everyone has the same one of, and that is seen in verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. The word author uh, is initiator. It's also the word prince in Acts 3.15, and it's the word captain in Hebrews 2.10. Prince, captain, author, leader, the one in charge. What did Joshua get the assurance of the night before he was supposed to go face Jericho? Jesus Christ came down to him and said, I am the captain of the Lord's host. And he had his sword drawn in his hand. And that gave Joshua the comfort to know that that big city of Jericho was no match because he was going to follow his captain, the one who was going to lead him into victory, the author of the victory the leader of the victory, the prince, the captain that he was going to follow. The captain is the same for everyone, but the race is yours. The race is mine, and it's individual. The people that are cheering in this race are all victors themselves. Those watching aren't the losers. Those cheering someone on aren't those that didn't make it. Those that are watching are Victors themselves that ran their own race. Peter, after Christ rose from the grave, uh, went back to fishing. Probably, well, any number of reasons why, but one could be is the thought that I, I can't do anything for God anymore. I, I messed up. I denied him three times. I left him at the time when he was uh, needed someone or you'd think people would support him the most. I left him at that time. I'm useless for God now. I've already failed. And and Jesus comes back and talks with Peter and and prods Peter back and, and restores Peter to a place of service. But while Peter is talking with Christ there in John twenty one, he says You've you've given me a difficult job to do, Jesus. You've said that I'm going to grow old and my life is going to be such to where someone else has to carry me around. That's going to be hard for me. And then he says, what, what's John, the disciple, going to do? What's, what's he got? Is, is he going to have a hard life? Is he going to have an easy life? Jesus abs- just totally blows off Peter's question. He said, that's nothing to you. I'm not talking about John. I'm talking about you. You follow me. And that's what God, I think, wants to do with each one of us. Stop talking about the person beside you. Stop worrying about what they are faced with. Stop worrying about whether they have it easier than you do or they, someone recognized them and didn't recognize you. You follow Christ. That's what God told Peter that night. And Peter had to be reminded about that. He still fumbled along the way. A couple more times we see clearly in Scripture, Peter messed up. But he was determined that he was going to finish the race that Jesus had for him. Not worry about John, not worry about Andrew, not worry about anyone else but what was commanded for him. It was his race. Think about the men that were given the talents in the parable. One got five, one got two, one got one. The job of the five-talent guy was to take five and do something with them. The job of the two-talent guy was not to take five talents and do something with it. It was to take those two talents and do something with it. Not sit down and complain about the five-talent guy. Not wonder why he got less and, and, and his friend got more. But take his two and do something with them. And the one-talent man, that was his job too. Two succeeded and one failed. Our race here. Some have said this is similar to the idea of us that Christians are called pilgrims. And, and we are. We're called pilgrims in a, in, in a foreign land. It's, we're, we're traveling through this land and we're just uh, going along. But the difference between that and this here is that the traveler, a pilgrim, can kind of go at his own pace. And if he gets tired, he can sit down and take a rest for a while and let some time pass. But the runner, the runner in the race, can't be afraid of dust or sweat or injury. 
his lungs and his muscles will be taxed to the extent of his ability. And if he does reach the goal, he'll reach the goal panting for breath because it's been a race and not a walk. Patience, again, here, running with patience is active perseverance. It presses on, unmoved and unhindered, despite the opposition that it faces all along the way. The race has a definite aim. Our aim is in verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Our race has a path that God appoints for us. This path can include duties that we're required to do, commands of Scripture that we know we're to do, duties as parents, as fathers, as husbands, wives, daughters, uh, duties as church members, duties that we face. But it also includes circumstances that come up. And if we're not careful, we'll say, oh, didn't know about, I didn't realize that circumstance was going to come up in this race. Whenever you find yourself saying that, you got to say, you know what, but God did. God did know that circumstance was coming up. And so, yes, while you're doing your duties, don't quit because, oh, I didn't know that this circumstance, I, did, I wasn't prepared for that. God has it there for a reason. He has it there for you to persevere through. That's not an excuse to quit because something unexpected came up. Something difficult came up. These are not random. These are part of your race. This race has a definite aim, a God-appointed path. It also has a steady advance. One preacher said a Christian life without advance has something fatally wrong with it. When our lives have no advance, something is not right because that is not a Christian life. That is not what the Bible says. So if we see no advance, then it's time to rush to the doctor and start getting the vitals checked out. Something's gone wrong. One man was traveling in, uh, through the mountains. And he was giving a record of what he saw. And it was the same thing day after day after day. And for consecutive days as he was traveling through these mountains, his diary entry read, Alps upon Alps arise. Every time I get to the top of this mountain, I look up and there's another part of the Alps in front of me. And I get to the top of this one. There's something else for me there. I just have to persevere. That's the Christian life. Alps upon Alps upon Alps. The mountain followed by another mountain. The race, another lap, another lap. Keep on going, moving forward, steadily advancing. Our race also includes strenuous effort. The word race here in verse 1 includes more than just the idea of, of, a, of a foot race. It also includes the idea that it's a contest. It is a, it is a battle. It's a conflict. Paul had to ask the Galatian church, ye did run well. What did hinder you? You were running good, but something hindered you. If we ask ourselves what hinders us, then the Galatian church had their own issue to deal with. They were hindered. But if we ask ourselves what hinders us in our Christian life, if we really ask ourselves that and, and step back and think about it, we will get an answer. We will get an answer. If we ask God, what hinders me? What pulls me back? When a man runs, he's fighting against the natural force. The natural force of gravity pulling him down and, and back. Yet the runner overcomes that natural force and succeeds. There is a battle within all Christians that is a force that we deal with constantly. It's the old man. The old man that wants to pull us down and pull us back as we try to make progress. He wants to tempt us. 
He wants to get us to think that our other way was a better way and to hold on to us tight and pull us back and keep us down. Gravity keeps the runner having to exert strenuous effort to keep going, to move forward. In the same way, a Christian in his life is going to have to battle that force of the old man that wants him, wants him to fail, wants to force him out of the race. We're battling ourselves. Effort, effort, effort is the secret of advancing in the Christian life. One old-time preacher told his congregation 200 years ago. Faith, this is followed up here. Romans, or, uh, Hebrews 12.1 is followed up, uh, it follows up the chapter of faith. For a whole chapter, we've heard about faith, 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 faith. And everybody's like, yes, let's live a life of faith. Let's be uh, men of faith. What does that mean? How does, how does that translate into what we do with our lives? Faith may stimulate and may strengthen your effort, but it never supersedes it. In other words, I may receive the power to run, but whether or not I run is actually up to me. I may have all the power in the world to run, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. They have all the potential and all the power uh, in the world to live our Christian life, but it still doesn't mean we're going to do it. That's up to me. God gives the ability. I have to provide the actuality. It has to start inside of me. God, one man said it this way, God doesn't provide us escalators. He provides us stairs. All right, people want the Christian life to be the ride to the top. That's not what God does. He says, there's a couple legs, there's some stairs, go to the top. The Bible doesn't say, you reap what you faith. It says you reap what you sow. Sowing is your part. You have a race. You also have a weight and a sin. So do I. Might not be the same for everybody. It's not the same for everybody. Your weight, your sin, it gets you. It's probably different from the person sitting beside you. But it do each of us well to think about ourselves and to ask ourselves what those are so we can deal with them. To lay aside every weight literally means to throw it away, to throw it off. To get so, to recognize it as being so damaging that I throw it away and move away from it. Don't want anything to do with it. Athletes, when they exercise and work out and perform, they want the lightest possible gear that they have. They're making tennis shoes lighter and lighter and lighter all the time. They're making uh, athletic uh, things like hockey sticks of lighter and lighter material. Why? Because athletes want just a little bit of an edge. Those that uh, ride bikes. And you go into a bike store. It's amazing. The more expensive the bike, once the bike gets into the thousands, that means it's super light. Hardly weighs anything. You can go that much faster on a light bike than if you go down to Kmart and get a Huffy and screw it together with these giant bolts and try to ride on that. You pay for things being light. Costs more for things to be light. Costs more in our life. Costs us something to make our life lighter, too. Costs us. Athletes use vests filled with weights when they're training. Sometimes on the college basketball team, Pastor Dan will have the big guys put on the, the called the weight belt. It's, it's a, a very heavy belt that goes around and has Velcro, and, and they wear that for uh, a lots of drills so they get used to that extra weight. And the idea is they're making practice that much harder. But never once did he ever tell somebody when they're getting ready to play the game to go put the weight belt on and compete with that on. That's ridiculous. That's that's crazy. No, it's time for the real thing. Get the weight off. Get the weight belt and put it away. What are the things that weigh us down? may be different for each one of us, but we better recognize, analyze them, 
name them and see what they are. The Bible is full of people who had to deal with their own hindrances. Think back to Moses. Moses did all he could to not be the one to go stand before Pharaoh. I can't talk. I'm not eloquent. I'm not able to. Excuse after excuse after excuse. Maybe he just didn't have the courage to do it. And that was excuses for him. To throw aside that weight. Fear of failure. King David spent a long time with the guilt of his sin. Psalm 32 tells us how that he realized God's forgiveness. And that guilt that plagued him was no longer something that he let hinder him from going on in the life of faith that God had for him. He reaped, undoubtedly. But he didn't let that change his belief in God. Jonah had a horrible attitude toward the heathen. Rather than him hating the sinners, he needed to realize the fact that God loved them. A hindrance he had to get over with. And Peter, we talked about. What is a weight? A weight, according to our text here, is things that we carry with us. Let us lay aside every weight. Things that we're to put away. Weights may be our tendencies. What are the things that can become weights? Asked again by an an old-time preacher, and he said this. Everything. Anything could become a weight if we're not careful. He said it's a mysterious power that we possess as humans of turning the greatest things that God has given into us into opportunities to fall back. You've seen people be so excited about something or something tremendous happens, and there's always a perimeter of people around that find something wrong with it and some way to to, to take the joy out of a situation. Don't be like that. That's a hindrance. And the people that, if that's you, that that is a terrible hindrance to God's work. Weights. The Bible says a man's foes shall be they of his own household. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. When we make those people that we love best our idols, not because we love them too much, but because we love them apart from God, that becomes a weight. Oh, People that don't believe in God, people that uh, reject God, people that ridicule God, people that ridicule the things of God can become a weight when we love them apart from God. There is no person that we should be able to be around to where God is not the main thing on our tongue, that God is not the main topic of our conversation. When we have to change what we say or how we act as Christians around a certain person, That person is then superseding God in our life. And that's a weight. That's a danger. That's a sin to be set aside, to be laid aside. A short list of potential weights. Materialism. Things don't have to be a problem, but they have become a problem. America's learning that lesson uh, today as you turn on the news. America's learning that the hard way. Bad habits. Wasting our life, wasting our time. One man said, could be the TV, could be friends. Why should we lay these weights aside? What's the benefit to that? Why should we do this? Because every step of our race, every step of our life, we are battling against a foe. And the more of the weights that we have, the more entanglements that we have, you say, oh, that's not a weight for me. That's not an entanglement for me. If your Christian life is not progressing always forward, then look around and find the weight. It's there and get rid of it. Every step of the road, we have to face the foe. It's a race, but it's a conflict in the race. It's a battling race. Every step of the road that we take as Christians is won by a strife, by a struggle. And there's no spiritual growth until we throw off and defeat the old man. One preacher said it has to be an execution. See, if we 
say, no, it's, I'll stop it for a little bit, and then we keep finding ourselves coming back to the same thing over and over again. Maybe we just need to say, let me just push it aside, but, but execute it. Permanently push that thing out of your life and make sure that it never comes back again. In our life, we are perpetual pioneers. We think about the days of the pioneers. They had to cut their way through the wilderness. They had to, what they made, how they lived, they did it with the work of their own hands. We are perpetual pioneers. God doesn't have anything good to say about those that dwell at ease in the cities, those that dwell at ease in Zion. And we're pioneering for our entire life. Every new step that we take is only because we've laid something aside and, and went ahead. Remember the times in your life when you really started to grow in the Lord? I mean, when, when God was really close and, and, and when you said, okay, I'm, I'm all out for God. When you did that, you pushed off a lot of things. You um, maybe moved uh, you may have chucked, uh, you may have thrown a TV out in the, in the yard. You may have taken stuff and said, enough of all this, and I'm done with this and that. And, and that friend that is a temptation for me, I'm taking their name out of my phone book. I'm not, not going to even go by there. I'm taking it away. And then the next day you started to live and you felt free. You felt strong. You felt excited. You, you felt like God was everything. And then some more time passed. And the old man comes back in and he throws some stuff your way. And you say, okay, okay. To where now the weights have slowed your race down to a walk. And every step is labored. It's hard. You're not making much progress, so the race isn't that much fun because you're not seeing much. You're not getting very far. It's all just a battle. Sitting in church services all the time is actually hard to do because of the entanglements that have worked their way back in again. That's what happens in the course of our race. If our progress has stopped... Two things. Number one, there are some weights that you need to lay aside again. And number two, you no longer feel free, clean, and committed to God. You just feel like just taking, I'm just putting one foot in front of another. Well, maybe I'll quit because it's too hard. It's too hard because of the weights that have crept back in. Progress in God's work. To see it, we've got to reject the selfishness that lifts ourself up. Our pride wants to lift us up. We're going to proceed for God. We're going to move ahead for God. It takes us deliberate effort to throw away selfishness that comes in. Along this race, if it's been successful, we could go along the way and find altars all along the way. An altar being a symbol of me dying to self. How often did Paul say he left an altar behind with himself on it? Do you remember that? He said, I die daily. His altar was daily for him. In order for him, why? Because in his race, he wanted to be free to serve God and committed to And able to persevere and able to go through the conflict. And his altar each day was what marked his life. So we have sins. Those are the obvious things. We better get those out right away. But then we have the weights. Somebody could say, you know what, I don't really have that many weights. I don't don't have, that's not a problem for me. Um, I don't, I'm not being slowed down. Well, that's where you've got to be honest with yourself and have Christian maturity and say, you know what, Lord, do I? Do I? And if I do, what will I do when you show it to me? 
If God knows that you're just going to keep on going and not deal with the weight, he's not going to show you what that weight is. Why should he? He's wasting his time. How do we throw off our weights? Well, learn from experience what hinders you. We all have experience in our life, and we all remember the times we got all tangled up and slowed down. Let that experience teach you. Don't make that mistake again. Don't go down that road again. Don't do that again. No, when I did that last time, I got weighted down. I'm not going there again. Not going to go see them again. Not going to watch that again. Not going to give myself the opportunity to be in that situation again. How do we throw these weights off? Number one, you've got to want to. You have got to want to. And then you've got to name the hindrance, not just... Leave it general. Name it. Describe it. And then talk to God about it. And let God know. And then find an accountability person that you know. Talk with them about it and ask them to ask you about it. And naming it is not just enough. You have to take action. Peter needed to be restored. Jonah needed to be corrected. David needed to repent. We go to the Lord again and again and again and again. How many Christians abuse the doctrine of eternal security? How We will answer to God if we abuse that doctrine. Probably the greatest gift that God has given to us is the fact that we have the confidence in this life to know that we're on our way to heaven. Nothing can take that away. And the gift that God gave us when he put us in his hand, and we're in the hand of Christ and we're there secure and safe. Yet we abuse that. We abuse that when we weigh ourselves down for our race and don't accomplish anything for God and don't move ahead. Verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus. That's a steadfast looking, and that looking has to do with turning your eyes off everything else. Turning your eyes away from everything else and looking to Jesus. And as Christians, that's where the rubber meets the road. We see Jesus. We're going to run. We're going to see our weights, and we're going to throw them away. We're going to see our sins, and we're going to throw them away. We're going to see what our life means, and we're going to focus on that. And we're going to see our race, and we're going to run it. And we come to the conflict in our race, and we're going to go through it because we are looking to Jesus. What he did for us, what he is doing for us, what he will do for us matters more than a silly weight. Matters more than a sin brings me greater joy than to hold on to that thing that's pulling me back. Laying aside weights doesn't uh, make one a better man. It only prepares him for the next battle in the Christian life. He puts aside his weights for a purpose. Why? So that he can run. We don't put aside our weights so we can sit around. We don't throw off that weight belt and go to the starting line to stand there. We do all that so we can get involved with the battle, get involved with the race. We do it for a purpose. We don't clean our hearts out and leave them empty and empty hearts, cold and and dull. We clean our hearts out and then let Christ fill it. All right. We throw off the weights. And not stop there. Then we run. We run with perseverance. What God has for us. One weighted down with care becomes despondent, plotting, miserable, complaining. Ask yourself this. Whether determining something's a weight for you or not. Will my family be better? Off if I cut off this thing? Will I have more time to invest as a husband and a father if I throw aside this weight? Will I be a better son or a da- better daughter if I lay aside this weight? Can I do more for God if I cut aside this hindrance that ends up Draining my time and my interest away from the time that I can invest in things for eternity. There's our race. 
There's our own weights and sins. There's also our own reward. Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of ourselves to God. And when the account was taken, the ones that succeeded in this life in investing for their Savior heard, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And they heard that individually because they had their own race with their own weights and sins to overcome. And because of that, they had their own, their own reward. Some may ask, you know, what's the use in bothering running this race and laying aside these weights if it's just going to be a constant struggle? If I have to look for the rest of my life, if just this battle, just this struggle, then what, what's the use of even trying? Alps upon Alps? That's not... I, I, want, I want the rest. I want the time where I can just take it easy. That, there is a special time God has prepared for that for us. It's called eternity, where we have that rest. What about the joy of running? What about laying aside the weight strictly for the joy of running the race? Do you really like to be the one that's not involved? Do you, do, is, that, is that person ever really happy? The one that just doesn't get involved. They're not a part. They're not where the action's at. They're not involved in what's going on in the conflict. Is that the one that's ever really happy? I know they're not. The joy of the race. The joy of the conflict itself. The joy of the cloud of witnesses. Those that have succeeded watching and, and, and urging, urging people that are here today on, urging them on. The joy that comes from that doesn't happen unless you're racing. What about the joy of hearing, well done? That's a one-time shot that we all have. We all stand before God and we have one chance to serve God in this life in order to please God and to hear Him be pleased with us. We have one time, one shot at that. And what about the joy of fellowshipping at the finish line with the others that have finished. There's, there'll be a group. There'll be a group there that realized, yeah, this was, a, this was difficult. This was a struggle. But I kept going. I patiently persevered over and over and over again. I had to untangle myself and cut off those weights and throw them away. I had to do it constantly. But I persevered. And then at that finish line, having given all the fellowship with the others that have done the same thing. And then thinking about verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, past his finish line. He was a finisher the author and finisher. And as we finish our life in the steadfast endurance of the race, we join him in fellowship of the finishers. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask God that you would challenge